Let's talk about the three cycle plan for applying as an employer for a nanny through the H2B visa. In other words, let's talk about the strategy you should undertake when you enter the H2B visa process in order to find a nanny that will be with your family for one to three years. There is a strategy to this. It's something I've developed over the many years I've been doing this program, and I'm excited to share it with you after the break. Hey everybody, this is Law Great. My name is Damien DeNoble, and today I'm talking to you about the three cycle strategy for the H2B visa process for nannies. This is video, I believe, number four in the series. We did an overview video. We did a video on how you qualify for uh, being a nanny employer through the H2B visa program. And then we did a video on how to pick your dream nanny or how to be more flexible. And this is video number four where I'm giving you the three cycle strategy for applying for a nanny. Three cycles? What are you talking about? Three cycles? What? So what is a cycle? Well, let's 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 just back up a minute, right? Uh, the, there are three steps in the H-2B visa application process. First, you apply for a certification with the Department of Labor. To do that, you need to file the prevailing wage with the Department of Labor. So that's step one. Second step is if you get certified by the Department of Labor and there are still visas left, you apply to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in order to get an actual visa slot. The third step is, is applying through uh, consular processing with the Department of State to actually bring your nanny into the country. Now, there are some steps in between that that are kind of bridging those like recruitment between the Department of Labor, approval of your application and full certification. There's the USCIS package application process and back and forth. There's actually uh, registering for an interview with the Department of State. I mean, there, there's other steps, but generally speaking, Department of Labor, USCIS, Department of State, three separate steps, okay? There are two cycles where you can apply with the Department of Labor each year. The first cycle of the fiscal year is for jobs that start on October 1st. This year is for jobs that start October 1st in 2022. This is the first half of the cycle for fiscal year 2022, 2023. The fiscal year starts at July 1st. That's when we can apply to have an annie that starts October 1st, okay? You have to, pl you have to apply within a certain window. Okay, that cycle, all the visas are already gone. I applied for that in July, okay? The next cycle is for the April 1st start date and we apply for that starting January 1st. April 1st start date and October 1st start date are different in that the April 1st cycle, which is the second cycle of the fiscal year, okay, is uh, lottery based. Technically they both have a lottery, but the April is a true lottery because there are more slots applied for in the first three days than available visas. Whereas in the October cycle we have you know, about three weeks probably to get an application in. There are gonna be about 150,000 applications last year for 33,000 slots. And so you, ha you have to apply in those, okay? What this means is that if April 1st is your first cycle for applying for a nanny visa, you got about a 75% chance of no matter how well you do of not getting a nanny because you're just not going to hit that lottery. You're not gonna be in the first 33,000 applications. So you need to have a plan to apply at least for a second cycle, right? To be ready to put in an application July 1st so that you can you know, get your nanny for the following October 1st start date. So in this case, if you're applying in the April 1st cycle for 22, 2023, you wanna actually plan to be getting your nanny around October, 2023, because you got about a 75% chance of missing that cycle. So that's a two cycle strategy. So why do I say three cycle? Well, if you start late uh, applying for the October 1st nanny, maybe you've, you've applied somewhere in late July because you didn't get your prevailing wage in on time. It happens all the time. I get those clients all the time. Then I say, hey, you got three cycles because uh, there's a good chance you're not going to get through everything on time to get a nanny for this October 1st, right? The visas are just going to be up. I always have clients in that boat. Then you're going to apply for April and then you're probably not going to get that because there's a 75% chance you don't. And then you're going to apply for next October. So it's a three cycle strategy that can take more than 12 months if you don't start on time. Ideally, it's a two cycle or a one cycle strategy. If you start in April, uh, this is your first cycle. Ideally, it's two cycle strategy because you're gonna be with me, for example, and I'm gonna make sure to file your prevailing wage for July and like April or May. And we're gonna have everything ready to go and file on July 1st. And we should have plenty of time, especially if we've already gotten the Department of Labor to approve your application in April. What do I mean by that? Well, the advantage of waiting is that once you get certified by the DOL in one cycle, under the one time occurrence category, that Department of Labor is not gonna ask you really any additional questions when you apply the next time. 
you know, you're gonna make sure that you're keeping your start date more or less the same. You might update and, you know, your cover letters, you might update your support documents, but more or less you're going to get an approval. And uh, that's why it's, it's still worth it maybe to apply early because you can get the kinks in the application if there are any from the Department of Labor's point of view out of the way, okay? There are a lot of pitfalls too that you, you, you're you gonna hit when you go through the first time, right? So one of the pitfalls that I saw this year is that we just randomly will have applications that get stuck uh, because the certifying officer forgets to check back when there's a notice of deficiency and they just let it sit, sit, sit. Or there's no notice of deficiency and certifying officer is just letting that thing sit, 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 sit. And in those cases, I have to call Department of Labor helpline and I have to let them know that I'm about to send an email that needs to be forwarded to the officer that's urgent. And I usually like get things moving. Sometimes you're going to have Department of Labor officers who are brand new, they just don't understand the program and they're going to want to initially deny because they say something doesn't meet temporary need. I've been able to avoid those because now I have a history of filings that I always cite in all of my nanny uh, applications as being prior approved so that that officer knows that this is something Department of Labor does approve. But if you're applying for the first time and you don't have that history, you might have some very skeptical officers. Another thing that happens is that when you have to get in things like the recruitment report, uh, Officers are sometimes not gonna read it well and they're gonna send back deficiencies and that's gonna slow you down. And overall, the Department of Labor's uh, main pitfalls are that your application gets stuck and forgotten. And just being able to know things like the fact that an officer has to reply within 10 business days, that um, there are certain notices of deficiency that should be you know, replied to once you put in an answer very quickly because they have you know, only a few minor things wrong with them. That sort of thing helps. Knowing how to write a job order helps. Having your state workforce agency uh, you know, squared away before the start of the process really helps because the state workforce agency can become another problem on the, uh, in this issue, okay? So overall, the Department of Labor can become a giant time suck. And even when you apply on time, you can, you can, you can get to this point where, you know, you're still racing to get things into USCIS. The USCIS has its own pitfalls. Uh, the USCIS, uh, it changes dramatically from administration to administration. So, under the previous Trump administration, the USCIS was a real barrier to getting applications in the H2B um, program approved, seemingly arbitrarily. We had some really kind of head scratchers um, during that administration. Whereas uh, here, they haven't been much of a barrier. It's really the Department of Labor that, that we've had to wrestle with. But things you can things that can happen, the USCIS will check to see if you've employed a nanny before right, um, under your LLC or sole proprietorship. They might look more broadly than that. They'll just say, hey, are these two individuals people who have employed a nanny before? And this is where you really wanna have an understanding of your prior employment history um, and documentation of it ready to turn in to the USCIS, for example. The USCIS also, rarely, but they might look at your ability to pay a nanny. Like, can you actually pay the nanny that you're coming to hire? And so that happens rarely, but they could ask for your bank account history to show that you have assets on hand to be able to pay this nanny readily. They might show, uh, ask you to show pay stubs. They might ask you to you know, fill out uh, costs and earnings kind of a worksheet to show that you're making enough money and your costs are low enough where you have something there that's gonna allow you to you know, pay a nanny the wage that you're supposed to pay every month, okay? But again, th th those are rarer stops than we see with the Department of Labor. And then the final kind of place uh, that you have to go to the Department of State. Department of State, you're working with individual consulates in individual countries, typically. Sometimes you're adjusting your nanny in country, okay? Uh, which is which is like a different thing. We file an adjustment status application, so we don't have to go to the consulate. But if they're outside the country, we're going to the consulate. It's confusing. There's no common strand often between one consulate's application process and another's. Some require interviews, some don't. Some have interviews that are like, prioritized and can be timed like that. Some like the Philippines have interviews that go 30, 45 days out and there's really nothing you can do and it's frustrating. And I think one of the things that, you know, I'm learning through this process, right? We're always constantly learning is that we need to go ahead and just get things like DS-160s, which are the non-immigrant visa applications like filed very quickly. And then we need to be just be ready to go through this confusing interview scheduling system, which are often done through, but not always kind of uh, private contractors that the Department of State has hired. And uh, we just kind of need to know what to do there ahead of time because it can be extremely frustrating. Even paying for visas in some countries is a nightmare. You have to have your 
nanny physically go out to a bank, pay with a receipt that's hard to find online, and boy, it's a, it's a head scratcher. Some department uh, of state consulates required nannies to mail in their documents. <sighs> Probably the most frustrating part. And uh, you know, you can lose a lot of time. So in general, with these sort of COVID, post-COVID world, current COVID world problems, consulates are understaffed, institutions in home countries are you know, struggling just like they are here, you should just basically anticipate that your start dates are gonna be much later than uh, what your actual start date is. So October 1st start date, you know, just plan on it being November 1st, that sort of thing. April 1st start date, plan on it in many cases being May 1st, right? So th this is the sort of thing where you know ahead of time that this is gonna happen, you're gonna have fewer frustrations. Okay, so those are sort of the challenges writ large. Um, it's good to have somebody that can help you navigate those. And certainly here at Frontier Tech Law, that's what I aim to do. Um, again, check out this nanny book, right? It has a lot of these uh, things summarized inside of it. Um, there's links at the bottom to it. And, uh, you know, subscribe, all right? The next video in the series is, are you ready to employ and recruit, right? So what sort of things should you be thinking about getting ready to be an actual employer um, in an immigration program as opposed to just a family that brings in a nanny through some sort of sponsorship organization which you may be used to while looking at au pair programs. All right, so thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.